Our mission statement at Shoreline Community Church is to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. And this week we're talking about being totally committed, the idea of discipleship. So it's not just a decision that we make, but it's actually a lifestyle that we live. We ask and call upon the name of the Lord to save us, to forgive us of our sins, and we're washed clean. But after that, there's a process, and we want to continue to grow in many different ways. In the second chapter of the book of Colossians, uh, Paul is writing to a church there, and he says this. He says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So what he's saying is, yes, you did receive Christ, but that's not it. That's not the end of the story. God wants you to continue to grow even after that moment in your life. Um, through a process that's called sanctification, we seek to be, become more like Christ every single day. And that means growth in a bunch of different areas. Uh, that means growing in character, uh, reflecting the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Um, all of these attributes we should be continually seeking to grow every day in. It means growing in knowledge of the Word, to continue to read our Bibles, to grow deeper in knowledge so that we can not only use it to help ourselves grow, but also to mentor others, to help others. It means growing in prayer and worship, um, being more in tune with God through conversation with Him, through respecting Him, and, and worship not only in the sense of singing, but also just living our daily lives and reflecting on Him and, and really making it a consistent part of our lives. It also means growing in service, uh, being willing to meet the needs of people around us, of causes around us, uh, just being willing to serve people in our everyday life. And finally, it means growing in community, not only the community at Shoreline and the people we interact with there, but also reaching out to people outside of our own community and caring enough to share the good news that we have with them. At Shoreline, discipleship looks like a lot of different things, but at the end of the day, it's really about helping others and helping ourselves grow closer to God and become more like Jesus Christ so we can be more equipped to live for Him, to worship Him, and to teach others about the joy that we have in Him. Somehow along the way, uh, something kind of got lost in this journey of walking with Jesus. For some people, not everybody, some people have this idea that being a Christian is this. It's you come to the cross, you acknowledge your sin, you confess your sin to Jesus, that he came, God with us, he lived, he died on the cross, he rose again, he paid the price, and we accept his forgiveness. And then, one day we'll go to heaven. And that's kind of the story for some people, but there's Within that story, there's that when I became a Christian to when I go to heaven. Now, all that I said was true. You can receive Jesus, be cleansed of your sin, and heaven will be your home someday, but there's the rest of this life. Whether for you it's 10 years or 70 years, there's this whole life, and there's this journey of walking with Jesus. We can't miss that. Coming to Jesus isn't just so that we go to heaven someday. It's so that God is bringing heaven to this earth through his people as we walk with Jesus in this life. And Jesus, when he talked to people, when he walked on this earth and they wanted to follow him, He'd say this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Boy, Jesus says, if you want to be my person, my disciple in this world, that your life's going to look like this. You follow me. You walk with me. You deny yourself what you want sometimes for God's glory. You, you, you take up the cross. You give your life for Jesus, and you follow step by step, day by day. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to be thinking about what it means to be a disciple, to walk with Jesus. We're in this four-week series called Deeper. And you see these, these images on the screen. These images are kind of the three main parts of our church mission statement. The first is this, this new life, this growth, this picture of being born again, new life. 
Shoreline Church exists to help as many people as possible know Jesus. I mean, we want to let people know that there's good news. There's a God who loves them. So we're going to keep reaching out. We talked about that last week. And then to become totally committed. This is discipleship, going deep in your faith, giving your whole life to Jesus. We want everyone who comes to know Jesus to grow in their faith, to learn. That's why you have the little feet there, just to walk day by day with Jesus, more closely with him. And then the third picture is an arrow pointing up. That's to Jesus Christ. It's all about the God that we worship. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who entered human history in Jesus Christ. So, so over these weeks, I'm inviting you to, to say, God, take me deeper. Deeper in reaching out to our community. Deeper as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus. Deeper as a worshiper. And if you pray that, and if you ask God to help you with that, he's going to do it. And you're going to go to deeper places in your walk with Jesus. Uh, it's funny, sometimes when I preach a sermon or a series and I use a particular image or an illustration, people get that picture in their mind, then they refer to the series or the sermon by that picture. So I'm pretty sure that someday down the line, someone's going to come up to me and say, remember that sermon you preached about the seal? Because if you were here last week, I talked about a harbor seal who followed me when I was swimming out at Lover's Point. And, and so uh, I want you to know, this series isn't so much about a seal it's about going deeper and the adventure and the joy of plunging into the waters of faith. Not just skimming across the surface, but going deep. And I hope that's what you want to do. I hope that's what you desire to do. And so today, today we're talking about going deeper in our walk with Jesus. How do we have our feet moving forward? And here's the question, how do we know? How do we know when we're following Jesus well? How do we know when we're growing up in faith? Now, as a kid, I knew when I was growing up because my dad and mom had this little process they did with us kids to measure our growth. In the wall of our garage, there was this one wall where all these hash marks going up the wall with Allison, Gretchen, Kevin, Lisa, Jason, the five of us kids. I don't know if your parents ever did this, but every so often my dad would say, hey, let's all go out in the garage. And he had this little ruler. My dad's kind of a meticulous guy, so we have to stand with our back against the wall, so, you know, shoulders against the wall, back against the wall. And I always wanted to be taller. I mean, that was one of the things I wanted to, like when he put the little mark with my name, I wanted to be bigger than I was before. Did anybody, anybody in their families ever do this? So, okay, so we're not that strange. So, so, and my dad would take the ruler and he'd like put it on top of your head and he'd put it straight to the, and, and I, I, he said, you had to have your heel, you couldn't stand like this and cheat. You had to keep your heels on the ground, but you try to get your spine as straight as possible. And he'd put a little hash mark. Then he'd take the ruler and he'd put a nice straight line and he'd put name, date, and then the height. And so once he'd done that, we could turn around and look. And the hope was that from the last time he did the little deal, that there'd be, you know, half an inch, inch, some, some kind of growth there. And for me as a kid, I wanted to see that I was getting taller. I was growing up. The dilemma with our spiritual lives is there's not a a spiritual ruler that you can kind of go, I mean, it'd be nice if there was, where every day you could kind of see how you are and turn and look on the wall and see where you're going. But, but I think there are some things that we can look at that'll help us see if we're growing spiritually. There's lots of different things. What we talked about last week and next week were two of them. You know, so sharing our faith and worshiping. But today I'm gonna to talk about seven different indicators, seven ways that you can kind of look at your life and see, how am I doing? You know, how am I growing? Am I taking that next step forward? If I, if, I, if I was a you know, little kid and my parents, and they, and they measured me and my dad said, okay, here you go, they drew the line, and he ran there three feet, 11 inches tall. And then a year went by and he did it again. And he said, uh, you're still three feet, 11 inches tall. Then another year went by and he said, still 3'11". And finally, like I'm 19 years old. And he says, you're 3'11". You know, and at some point I'm going, but I want to grow more. Why is it that spiritually we can be content uh, you know, I came to know Jesus. I kind of believe in him. I, I do a little religious stuff, and that's enough. Shouldn't we want to grow? Shouldn't we desire to grow? And that's my hope and prayer for all of us is that there'd be such a desire that we keep growing in our faith. And the beauty of the Christian faith is you know, there's always a deeper place to go, and there's always more grown up that we can be. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul gives this incredible kind of goal. He says that we should grow up into the measure of the stature of, of the fullness of Christ. I mean, that's the goal, that you would grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How's that going for you? Anybody here yet reached the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Fully expressing the presence of Jesus in all you say and do and think. Anybody there yet? Kind of quiet. That's because you're not, and neither am I. But we want to keep moving on that journey. So, so here's seven different ways that we can be moving forward and growing spiritually, ways that we can kind of check our lives and see how we're doing. Number one, 
We go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we love God and people with increasing intensity. You want to look on the wall and see where those hash marks are and how you're doing? Here's the question. Do I love God more today than I did a month ago or a year ago? Is my love for God growing? And as I love God more, guess what? I learn to love people more. Am I loving God more? Am I loving people more? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. Listen to these words and notice the orders. Loving God first because that fortifies us to love people. Jesus replied, and he'd been, he's being asked, what's the most important of all the things in the Old Testament, all the law, of all the prophets? What's most important? Here's what he says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Love God, love people. Everything falls into those two baskets. Everything can hang on those two hooks. Do you love God? Do you love people? How's that going for you? Are you growing in your love for God? And I want to suggest, and there's a lot, and this is, all the topics today are all going to be part of sermons in this coming year. We're going to go deeper and deeper in walking with Jesus, but I'm going to give some introductory thoughts. And and so, you know, how are you doing in loving God more? And I would suggest this. If we say we love someone, we should actually want to and desire to spend time with them. Is that fair to say? If you really love, and the more you love someone, probably the more you want to spend time with them. So here's, here's a thought. Maybe in growing to love God more, we can look at our lives and say, how much time am I spending just to be in his presence, just to walk with Jesus? I have three sons. And if you said to me, Kevin, do you love your sons? I'd say, yes, I do. I love them a lot. And they say, well, and then you said to me, well, hey, how are they doing? Give me an update. How are they doing? And I say, I have no idea. And you say, well, well, I mean, do you spend any time with them? No, not really. Well, when's the last time you saw any of them? It's been about four years. Talk to them on the phone, text them? No, but I really love them. There's a point at which when you're asking about my sons and you discover I know nothing about them and I'm not engaged with them, you're going to start thinking, what? He may not really love them that much. Because they all live in Monterey. It's not that far away, you know. It wouldn't be that hard to spend time with them. But you say to me, Kevin, tell me about your boys. And I start telling you about each one of them. And you see the light in my eyes. And you see the joy I have in being their dad. And when's the last time you saw them? Well, I had lunch with one of them this last week. And we just talked about life and faith. And, had a, and I start telling you about their lives. And you, you realize I'm engaged with them. I talk with them. I spend time with them. You go, oh, man, he hangs out with them. He, he knows about their lives. He really loves them. I think it's like that with God. Oh, I love God. He's first in my life. Really, how much time you spend with him? Well, I'm busy. Wait a minute. The more you love, the more you want to be with someone. Are you growing in spending time with God? So here's, here's the little, I'm just going to give little challenges today. Here's a deeper challenge. Love takes time. Block out specific times to spend with God in the coming 30 days. This is a 30-day challenge. Daily. I want to challenge every person here to block out on your calendar 15 minutes a day. If you're already doing more than that, great. But if you're not spending any time, I mean, so I go to church on Sunday, isn't that enough? Not if you really love God. You'll want to get to know him better. And all the other things I'm going to talk about, I'll give you some ideas of what to do in this time. But if you're not spending time with God, 15 minutes a day, start there. And pick prime time. If you are sharp and clear-minded in the morning, pick the morning. If your brain works like mud in the morning, don't do it in the morning. All right? Maybe lunch break for you is great. Maybe in the evening, maybe later at night. Pick a time where your brain is sharp, your heart is engaged, where as much as you can, you can push aside distractions. And at least 15 minutes a day, spend time with God. For 30 days, give it a try. Just that time with God will deepen your love and will grow your maturity. It will grow you up as a Christian. And then once a week, I want to challenge you you to spend like half an hour to an hour, once a week, with God. Again, I'll give you some ideas as we go along here of what to do with that time. And then once in the next month, block out like two hours for a little mini retreat. Take a walk in the Toro Hills. Take a walk down by the ocean. Don't put your earbuds in. Don't take anybody else with you. Just take a walk with God. And again, I'll share some ideas on how you can fill in and use that time. But make time to be with God. I think that our our love for God grows as we spend time with Him. And as we spend time with Him, we deepen in our faith. That's the first thing, growing in our love for God and then out of that love for people. Here's the second thing. We go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we talk with Jesus in prayer. Daily, personal, passionate, two-way prayer. Now, we can do a whole series on prayer, and we have before, and we will again. But, but part of the way, if you want to go deeper in faith, you want to grow in your maturity, see those hash marks on the wall move up, talk with God. Be in prayer. 
If you have your Bibles, follow along in Hebrews chapter four, beginning in verse 14. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended to heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus came to this world. He faced temptations. He never sinned. And look at verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with, what's the word? Confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can draw near to God anytime with confidence because his door is open and his heart is open. God wants to hear from you and God wants to speak to you. God wants to converse with you and work in your life. And you can draw near his throne of grace with confidence because the door is always open. I would put it this way. God's door is always open or his, his light on his door is always a green light. Now, I say that because on my office door here at Shoreline Church, if you were to go up to my office, there's a little brown box and there's three lights on it, red, yellow, green. Some of you guys think this is strange, but this is how I live my life. Red, yellow, green. And next to it, there's an explanation of each light and what it means. So when I go to my office and I flip it on the red light, it says in this little paragraph, it says, when I'm in red light mode, it means I'm working on a sermon, I'm praying over something, I'm meeting with somebody from the church or somebody from the staff, and so the light's red because I'm in the middle of something really important. You can knock if it's really important. But if you understand if you knock, I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing and take care of what you need. Yellow light means I'm working on stuff, but it's not that urgent, so you can knock, but you know, it means I'm in the middle of something. And green light and the door open means come on in. Guess what light's on most of the time? Take a wild guess. It's red because there's lots of stuff to do. But God's light is always green, all right? And I look and say, why is my light red sometimes? Because I'm not all powerful, <laughs> I don't reign above all time and all the universe. I'm just a guy who loves Jesus, who's a pastor. And I think I have to get done every single week. And so sometimes I'm on red light mode, but God's always green. Anytime, anywhere, you can walk into God's presence. It's the walk of it and talk with him and listen to him. So, so here's the challenge. And, and, and I want you to hear this. Take time in prayer. And I want to challenge you. I'm calling this challenge, ask and listen. I think most of us know how to pray in terms of talking to God, telling him what we're thinking, asking for certain things. I want you to deepen your prayer life by asking God questions in your 15 minutes or your once a week, half hour, or your once a month, couple of hours. Ask God specific questions and wait quietly and ask him to answer you. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sat quietly? J Jesus said in John chapter 10 that we're like a sheep and the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd. The question is not, does God speak to us? Here's the question, will we listen and do what he says? Because God is speaking, and God wants to continue speaking to us. So take time to ask God. Here's three questions you can ask God in some of your quiet times throughout this week and throughout the coming month. Listen to his answers. Number one, ask God this question. What have you done to show me the greatness of your love for me? Just ask God that question. Just you and him alone, you're in your truck on a lunch break, you're at a chair at home in the morning having a quiet time for 15 minutes, whatever it is, and say, God, just remind me of what you've done to show your love for me recently in the past. And just wait. And God's gonna begin to show you things in the last week or two that he's done to watch out for you, protect you, provide for you. Say, I love you. He may just put a picture in your mind of the cross. He says, this is what I did for you. I gave the life of my only son because I love you that much. God, what have you done to show your love? And just listen and see what impressions God puts on your heart, what gentle words he speaks to you, and thank him for those things. Here's another question you can ask God in a quiet moment with him. God, is there something good and honoring to you that you really want me to begin doing? I mean, you have to be serious because God's gonna answer this. God, is there something that would really honor you that's a good thing that I should start doing right now? What God might say quietly to you is this. Yes, I've been telling you for three months and you know what it is. God, can you give me a different thing that you want me to you know, But there may be something he wants you to start, you know, to, to care for your spouse in a different way, to spend time with this person, to talk, talk to a neighbor. There's something he's been prompting you, and he may just say, that thing I've been putting on your heart for the last few weeks, start doing it. Then you've got to decide. The question is not, is, does God speak? It's will we listen and follow? Because God's always speaking. And here's the third question. God, is there something I should get out of my life? You say, God, is there an attitude, a behavior, a pattern 
something I'm doing that just doesn't honor you that you want to get out of my life? Is there a relationship that's poisoning my soul and ruining my faith that you want to get out of my life? There, is there something going on that you want to deal with? And you sit quietly and say, God, if there's something, just show me one thing right now that needs to be dealt with, an attitude, a behavior, a pattern, whatever it is. And God, if you'll show me, I'll start taking those steps to get it out of my life. God wants to answer these questions. We have to be quiet and listen. I want to challenge you to enter his presence with confidence, to talk with him about what's on your heart. Number three, we go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we know, love, and dig into the word of God. When you know this book, when you love what God has given you, when you, you, when you love the scriptures and what God is teaching us, when you open this and learn and listen to God from his word, you will grow. If you want to find one thing that will help all these other things happen, and if you want to see that mark on your, the wall kind of go up as you're growing spiritually, get to know this book. This book is the very word of the living God. From the first word of Genesis to the last word of Revelation, this is the Holy Spirit-breathed truth of God. It really is. If you don't have a copy, as always, go to our Connection Center. They'll give you a free copy today. We'll give you a Bible, the same version I use when I preach so you can follow along when I preach. And, but, but this is God's truth. So are you learning his truth? Are you reading the word of God? In the book of Psalms, Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. And in the book of Psalms is Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. And I want to read part of that to you, not the whole psalm. It would take the rest of my sermon to read the whole psalm. It's a long psalm. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 119, verse 97. And notice if you're following on the screen, the words that are underlined and in red, they all mean the same thing. They mean the Word of God, the Bible, the Scriptures. It says your precepts, your laws, your truth, your ordinances. It all means the truth that you've revealed in your Word here. And I want you to notice what it says about the Bible, about God's Word. Chapter, uh, Psalm 119, beginning of verse 97. I love how it begins. Oh, how I love your law. God, I love your word, your truth. How I love your law. I meditate on it, how long? All day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on your statutes. I keep your word, your truth running through my mind and running through my heart. Verse 100. I have more understanding than the elders for I obey your precepts, your truths. I don't just know them. I follow them. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. When you know the word of God and when you're following it, all of a sudden your feet don't go on the same paths they used to go on because God's word shows you what's right and shines light in the darkness. Verse 102, I have not departed from your laws for you yourself have taught me. God teaches you through his word. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. There's a sweetness to the truth of God's word. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. I love this. The psalmist says, the more I get to know your word, the more it guides my paths. And I get to the point where I'll be reading God's word and I'm walking with Jesus and I'm learning and I'm walking this path of life and I'm reading God's word and I realize it says there's a path that's not the right path. It's unwise and ungodly. And I look down and I realize I'm walking on that path. So I stop and I, the Bible uses the word repent. I turn around. I stop walking on that path and I follow God's ways. And then all of a sudden I find out I'm back on that path again. You ever been there? I'm doing the same attitude, same behavior, and I repent again. But there comes a point as that hash mark's going up the wall and as you're growing in God's word and as you're praying, as you're walking with Jesus and loving God more and more, where the point you look and you say, that path I used to walk on, not only do I not walk on it, I can't believe I ever did. I hate that. But I was like that. There's a lot of old paths I used to walk on I don't walk on anymore. There's still other paths that God's showing me I shouldn't be walking on. But it's this book, it's the scriptures that guide us and teach us and direct us. And God, by his spirit, then empowers us to walk in the ways to honor him. I want to challenge you to grow in the word of God. If you go to Shoreline's website, there's, there's this big tile that says next steps. It looks just like that. And if you click on that next steps tile, it gives a list of all kinds of things that you can do to start walking, particularly if you're younger or newer in faith. It talks about how to get baptized, our baptism class. There's an 18-week video series to help you with learning how to read the Bible, how to pray, just starting along in your walk of faith. There's, you can register there for a spiritual gifts class to, dis to discover your gifts and how you can serve Jesus with your gifts. There's a recommended reading plan for how to get started in reading the Bible. All that on that one page. And then we have a class every so often called Believer's Path. And the Believer's Path is just a basic class for two hours 
that walks through how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to get started. So if you're a new Christian, and you can be a new Christian because you've been a Christian for two weeks, or you might be, have been a Christian for six months or eight months, and you haven't started taking steps and you're still feeling pretty new, that class is happening next Sunday, one o'clock to three o'clock. There's details. You can go register at the Connection Center, go online. But if you say, I, I want to start taking those next steps, those first steps of faith, we want to help you. We can't help you in just once a week Sunday service. We have more things for you, but you have to take advantage of those. We invite you to be a part of that. So here's the deeper challenge when it comes to the word of God. Get the filter in place. Make a time on a regular basis to read and reflect on the Bible. Pray to, pray to learn. God, teach me through your word. Read slowly. Look for application, life change, and then live out what God teaches you. Learn to live like this, with the word of God in and on your heart like a filter for all the garbage that's coming at you. And there's a, just a growing amount of garbage. And then learn to live with the Bible like this. You don't have to balance it on your head. You know, it'd be nice. You could do this. This would be like a, people would ask you about your faith, I suppose. Uh, but probably not in a good way. But you can, you know, basically, you don't have to literally carry the Bible on your head, but let the word of God become a filter for your mind and a filter for your heart. And that happens as you read it, as you study it, as you dig in. So one thing you should do in that 15-minute daily time for the next 30 days to try is to open this book. Talk to God in prayer. Express your love to him, but also open this book. If you say, I don't know where to start. Every week in the bulletin, we print seven days of reading that are chosen specifically to get you ready for the next Sunday sermon. And if you lose your bulletin, go to our website, click on day one, day two. It'll open the passage for you on your phone, your iPad, your computer, or show you where it is. And if you want to listen to it, you can, once you open the passage, you can click on the little microphone up on the side and it'll read it to you. So, but... but listen to, read, immerse yourself in the Bible every single day. If you want to grow in your spiritual journey, the Word of God is so critical. Number four, we go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we live and walk in community with loving accountability. We can't walk alone. We can't be in isolation. We have to walk with each other. We have to be in community. In Acts chapter 2, there's this picture of the new church. The church is young. The church is being born. And people discover they need to be together. They need to connect with each other. So we read this in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, being together, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together. They had everything in common. They, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The picture here is walking in community. It's not a picture of saying, okay, everyone has to sell everything, put it into one account, and you know, it's not, that's not the point. But the point is this. When you get together in groups of people, when you build strong relationships, and you're in those kind of groups, those connection relationships, and someone has a time of need, you know what? You want to help them. You understand that you're family. You care about them. There's people in the church that feel isolated because they're not connected in a group. And Shoreline's a pretty good-sized church. There's lots of people here. I want to challenge you to think about being in a group. This, this is your deeper challenge. Try a growth group. These are groups that meet weekly or every other week, groups that pray together, that read the Bible together, that learn together, that encourage each other, that challenge each other. Just go to the Connection Center or call the church office and ask about being part of a growth group. In three weeks, we start a new series called You'll Get Through This. It's a study of the life of Joseph who went through a lot of hard times, but every step of the way, God was with him. And we're gonna walk on his journey with him and we're gonna be launching new growth groups three weeks from now. So if you say as an individual, as a couple, if you say, I've never been in a growth group. I don't even know what it's like. I wanna challenge you to just pray, get courage and sign up. And the team will try to find a growth group kind of near where you live. You say, well, gosh, I'm out in Salinas or I'm out in Marina or I'm out in Carmel. We'll try to find a growth group in your area. We'll try to find a growth group you fit into, but give it a try. That's going to be about, a, I, think, I think it's a six-week commitment. And try it. And you may just go, man, I love this. I know people that have been part of growth groups that they just go, I'll never not be in a growth group. I love it. But we need that community, that connection. And being together grows us in our faith. Number five, we go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we serve with joyful consistency. You want to go deeper in your faith? Start to serve. Find a place to serve here at Shoreline, in our community, in your neighborhood, somewhere that in the name of Jesus, you serve others. 
Listen to what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Here's the simple challenge. Commit at least one to two hours every week to some act of service that shows the love of Jesus and causes you to rely on and trust in him. Find one thing you can do. Now, some of you say, I'm already doing that. Great, keep doing it. Some of you say, I'm pretty busy. I'm just talking one hour a week. If you don't know where to start, call the church and say, I want to give one hour a week. And we'll we'll talk about your gifting and your passions. We'll find a place for you. But, But you want to see that line go up the wall. You want to see yourself growing spiritually? Serve. So much of my growth as a Christian through the years has come when I just said, I'll serve. I I was volunteering and teaching for years before I became a pastor. But I felt like God wanted me to do that. And every time I would teach, God would do more in me, I think, than he did in other people through the teaching. My preparation caused me to go deeper. It grew me. Every time I would serve, God would draw me near him and make me rely on him. So I want to challenge you. One hour a week, if you're not serving, find a place and get engaged. Number six. We go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we give with cheerful generosity. When we are joyful and generous and living with open hands, willing to share because God's been good to us. And that generosity grows our faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 18 and 19 says this. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, lots of good things that we do, and to be generous and willing to share our resources. Good things, generosity. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the age to come so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Here's the reality. God calls all of us to be generous and to give, every one of us. And as we do that, we grow. Now, I'm not, I don't, some pastors will say, well, listen, if you give $10, you'll get back 100. If you give 100, you'll get back 1,000. It's like a spiritual Ponzi scheme. It's like a spiritual you know, multi-tier pyramid marketing program, you know. That's not the point. When God says be generous and you'll experience blessing, blessing comes in a thousand different shapes and forms. And oftentimes it will not be in financial resources. Sometimes your giving is just a matter of seeing lives have been changed. That's a pretty good blessing. Sometimes your giving is just that you go, man, I'm being obedient to God. That's a blessing. And so in Malachi, I love this passage. Where Malachi, in Malachi 3.10, it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. You'll get more blessing than you can imagine, but it's gonna be all kinds of blessing. So here's the simple challenge. Test God for three months. I want to challenge every person here to try this, to pray about this. Some of you will do it, some of you will not. But here's the challenge. Set up a weekly or monthly financial giving goal. Say, this is what I want to give every week or every month. Set a goal. And then follow through for three months and see what happens. Start growing more generous. And just watch and see if you experience different kinds of blessings. And watch and see if you find yourself spiritually growing in a way that you haven't for a long time. There's something about that generosity that triggers spiritual growth. And then number seven. We go deeper in our walk with Jesus when we seek holiness with increasing passion. Part of our growth is seeing stuff in our lives that's unholy, impure, that's just a mess, and saying, God, I want to be done with that. I want to seek what you want for my life. And we start just kind of clearing stuff out with the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, we read this. For God did not call us to be uh, impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You want to grow in your faith. You want to grow more mature. Notice those things that are kind of messy laying around your life and clean them up. Have you ever noticed that when something's kind of piled up around the house or whatever, and it's there for a while, at first you go, oh, that shouldn't be sitting there. And after a few weeks and after a month, you're like, it's just part of the furniture. (laughs) So for instance, like maybe a giant pile of wood in a church lobby, okay? And there it sits. And the first time you walk in, you go, what's that giant pile of wood doing there? Some of you walked in today and walked right past a giant, awkward, ugly pile of wood, and you didn't even notice because it's been there for like a month. It's, well, that's just our decorations. We just like piles. No, 
We're putting a whole new floor in. Soon, we're hoping, we're praying, but soon, you know. But, but you just don't notice after all. Walk around your life like you would around the lobby of your house and go, is there something sitting around? Something just, maybe it'd be something real simple. You go, I can get rid of that. I'm not talking about things in your house. I'm talking about in here. Attitudes, behaviors, patterns, things you're doing. Say, God, I want to grow in holiness. You grow in maturity as you grow in holiness. This is part of the Christian life. We, we exist as a church as Christians to help as many people as possible to reach out, to become totally committed, to walk step by step, day by day in our walk with Jesus, to go deeper with Jesus so that we can see that maturity level rise. And as it does, we give God the glory and we get the wonderful benefit of becoming more and more like Jesus. It's a privilege, but guess what? It takes work every day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may we be a church filled with people who are growing in faith, walking more closely with Jesus, diving deeper into who you are, O oh Lord, that we might grow in maturity to become more and more like Jesus with each and every passing day. We pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. I want to hand off the venues to their venue pastor. We'll share a couple things with you. And right